Good morning. morning. Please be seated. As I said at eight o'clock, it's hard to believe that I'm already into my third month with you here in Christ Church, but this will be the 11th Sunday that I've had the pleasure of leading your worship. How time flies when you're enjoying yourself. May that be true for you as well. I certainly hope that we all find joy in our celebration of worship this Sunday morning as we come together as God's family here in Christ Church, a small part of the worldwide family of God. Let me welcome each and every one of you to this service, especially any who may be joining us as visitors this morning. And if you are a visitor, may I invite you to sign the visitor's book, which is at the back of the North Isle, the aisle that faces me. I would also remind you that at the close of this service, there will be a short celebration of the Sacrament of Holy Communion. And if you wish to stay for that, please gather in the center uh, pews. Uh, and in that service, we will also have a time of prayer for all those for whom prayer cards have been put in. Come now in worship before the Lord God. Bring him your praise and adoration your fears and concerns, your joys and your hopes. Listen for his word for you. Then open not just your hearts and minds, but also your hands and your lives, that in your living you may proclaim his glory and his love. Come then, stand up and bless the Lord as we sing to his glory and praise our opening hymn, number 202. Stand up and bless the Lord, all people now rejoice. Thank you. Having praised the Lord in song, let us now turn to him in prayer as we bring him our prayers of adoration and confession. Please be seated. Let us pray. Loving God, as we come to worship you, we bring our gifts and we bring ourselves. We bring our hopes and we bring our fears. We bring our experience of this last week whether good or bad, exciting or boring. But above all, we bring our adoration and praise for the beauty of your creation, for the life you have breathed into us, for your unfailing love toward us. And yet, we are conscious of the times when we have denied or ignored your love, when we have broken faith with you and with those we love, when through our neglect 
We have damaged your world. For all such times, forgive us, Lord. Take our neglect, our brokenness, our denial, and weave them into a new pattern. Set us free from old ways. Strengthen us to make amends and help us to live again as whole people through the love of Christ the healer. And now we join together to pray in the words Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Boys and girls, would you like to come forward and find a space on the floor? Good morning. Okay. Oh, I forgot it was spaghetti Sunday. Well, well done. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks to those who brought spaghetti for spaghetti Sunday, even if the minister forgot. Right, I'm wondering this morning if any of you play either football or some kind of a, a ball game. It might be netball, it might be all sorts of things. Yeah, quite, quite a lot of you. Okay, good, good. And I wonder, are any of you in any kind of team that plays these games, or do you just play for fun? Oh, you're in the team, you're in the team. God, quite a few of you, that's good. What is it, when, when you're in the team, what are the team trying to do when you're playing that kind of a game? What are you trying to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, part of the team is trying to defend the goal. That's right. What's the other half trying to do? Trying to, trying to score. score, yeah. Trying to score a goal or you're trying to score a basket or whatever it might be. Depends on the game. Um, and usually in most teams, there's at least one person who's really good at scoring goals. Uh, or if you're really lucky, you hope there's more than one. Are you good? Um, uh, okay. So you want somebody who's good at scoring goals. But what I wonder would happen if your team's goal scorer suddenly decided he or she was going to start scoring goals for the other team. Would that be a bad idea? Yeah, I think that's not very clever, is it? And your team wouldn't then have much of a chance if your best goal scorer was going to go and help the other team to score goals against you. Uh, and you really wouldn't know what was happening. You wouldn't know what side they were on. And if we're thinking about Jesus, he also had a team. What did he call his team? What were his team called? The disciples, that's right. So the disciples were Jesus' team. They weren't playing football, they weren't playing netball, but they were his team of players. And they worked with Jesus. They were part of the work that Jesus was doing in that part of the world at that time. And today, we come to church to share in that work, to be part of that team, to carry on with the story of Jesus. But there was also another group of people who followed Jesus around, who weren't part of his team, who wanted to uh, almost kind of score goals against Jesus' team. And they were, boys, boys, can you keep your talk till later? Thank you. Okay, they couldn't deny what Jesus was doing, the good things he was doing, because all the people could see what Jesus was doing, but they didn't like what Jesus was doing. And they said that Jesus, what he was doing, 
He was doing for bad reasons, not for good. They wanted to try and frighten people away from following this man, Jesus. But Jesus told them that he could hardly be supporting evil when the things he was doing were good things, that he was helping people, that he was being kind to them, that he was showing love to them. So how could he be working for, for evil, for bad things, if he was doing good? So, as we try to follow Jesus today, we need to try to make sure that we don't score goals against our own side by doing things that Jesus wouldn't like us to do. Maybe we won't always manage to do that, because even in professional football teams, sometimes a player will put the ball through their own goal and score, what, what would you call that kind of goal, if you score against your own team? score an own goal. That's right. And sometimes that happens. But they certainly don't mean to do it. They don't intend to score a goal for the other team. And they probably try, after they've done it, to do that. Make, try really hard to make amends for what they've done. And that's what we need to do if we do get things wrong sometimes. We need to try and make things better. Uh, and we'll always try to make sure that we are playing for Jesus' team, to do the things that Jesus would want us to do. And in our next hymn, we're going to sing about traveling the way we should. In other words, doing what we ought to do. And doing it even if things get a bit difficult, a bit rough. So we're going to sing the hymn, One More Step Along the World I Go. Number 530. Lord Jesus, as our children step out on their journey of life, bless them and help them to make the right choices that they may always play for your team and show your love for the world. Amen. Enjoy your time together this morning, boys and girls. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you.
Hear the word of God proclaimed in the Old Testament. And the first reading is from the first book of Samuel, chapter 8, from verse 4 to verse 11, and then verse 16 to 20. Then the, all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him to be king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariot chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And then verse 16. He will take your male and female slaves, the best of your cattle and donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, who you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, and we are determined to have a king over us so that we also may be like other nations, and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. The second reading is from the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, from verse 13 to chapter 5, verse 1. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with the scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace is it, as it extends to more and more people may increase thanksgiving to, glory, to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what we have seen, but at what we cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earth, the tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens.
Gospel reading for this Sunday comes from the Gospel according to St. Mark, and we read there in chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. You'll find this on page 37 of the New Testament section of the Pew Bibles. Mark chapter 3, reading from verse 20. Then Judas went home, and the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they have said, for they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mothers and brothers and sisters are outside, asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Amen. May God bless to us these readings from his holy word. To his name be the praise and the glory. Let us sing the hymn number 624, In Christ There Is No East or West. We sing this to the tune, St. Peter. Let us pray. O God, the strength of those who seek you, direct my words and all our listening and thoughts that we may more fully know you and more perfectly love you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I suspect we don't often hear sermons on Old Testament texts. But today it's a reading from 1 Samuel that is the basis for my sermon. It takes us back to the beginnings of early Israel's experiment with kingship. Not unusually, 
The Bible is not content with a simple story of success or failure. It knows, as no other ancient documents and few modern documents know, that significant cultural change is fraught with ambiguity and complexity. A bit like any change in the church today. The period of the judges in ancient Israel lasted some 200 years. And you can get a flavor of that period if you read the Old Testament book that bears that name. It was a time of great confusion and discord, marked by much violence during periods of anarchy. Leadership came from the unexpected anointing of the divine spirit, a spirit that fell on the great, such as Deborah, and the less than great, such as Samson. Each judge, or we might almost call them warrior leaders, had a time of success. But that was fairly quickly followed by a time of failure, even of disaster, which then awaited the appearance of another divinely appointed ruler. It was a very uncertain way to govern any emerging nation. Its lack of stable leadership was bound to create dissension. The last judge of Israel was was Samuel, though it could be said that Samuel was more than a judge. At the height of his power, he controlled every aspect of the culture, economic, political, and religious. As we begin chapter 8, the super judge has grown old, and so he made his sons judges over Israel. The aging prophet, priest, ruler, clearly has in mind the creation of a dynasty with his sons as the rightful heirs. Surely no one would deny the mighty Samuel the right to determine his successors. After all, he has led Israel well. Who better than the great man's sons to follow his sterling example? The name of the eldest son is Joel, meaning Yahweh is God. His second son is Abijah, meaning Yahweh is my father. Could there be any more suitable names for budding leaders of Israel? While Samuel was still able, he'd wisely established the boys as judges in Beersheba, the desert area in the far south of the land, in order to give them some experience for the greater task of ruling the whole land after his death. All seemed set to create the Samuel dynasty, a sort of permanent judgeship with son following son as long as Israel lasted. But as we heard in our reading, there is a huge problem. Your sons do not follow your ways, the elders of Israel tell Samuel. Indeed, in verse 3, We are told that they are only interested in making money, that they take bribes and pervert justice. What a contrast to Samuel, who had given his life for the stability of Israel, apparently reaping few rewards for himself. But now his appointed sons and heirs are infamous for violence and evil. Surely these louts must not be allowed to rule. Surely the wise Samuel will see that something, something different must be done. Will he have the necessary vision to secure the future of Israel? Will we have the vision we need to further God's mission in the world today? Let's ponder these thoughts as we sing our next hymn. The hymn is number 465, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart.
Please be seated. Back to our story. The leaders of Israel feel they can wait no longer to approach Samuel. He may die at any time and leave these monstrous sons in command. And so they go to his home in Ramah and say, You are old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. Was this such an unreasonable request? After all, Samuel himself had already begun a process to change the established method of selecting Israel's leaders. Why not go all the way and establish a kingship so that stability of authority might be fixed and Samuel's disgusting sons kept from getting their grubby hands on power? I would guess that Samuel's displeasure at the proposal was more than a little of a surprise to the leaders of Israel. But perhaps it rankled with him. After all, he'd given his life in the service of Israel and never asked to be king. But more than that, he may well have been infuriated with the idea of Israel becoming like other nations when he saw Israel as the special people of Yahweh. And so he prayed to Yahweh, who replied, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them, just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Although Yahweh twice tells Samuel to listen to the people, in other words, to give them a king, what Samuel hears are only the final words of warning. And so he goes on to describe to the people a monarch who will virtually enslave them, concluding in verse 18, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Most assuredly, Samuel had given a warning, but he says and does nothing concerning God's repeated command to give them a king. The people, though, are not convinced and do not listen to Samuel and restate their determination to have a king. They not only want stability, they also want to reject the specter of Samuel's chosen heirs. So once again, Samuel prays. And again, Yahweh's response is clear. Listen to their voice and set a king over them, he says. Astonishingly, again Samuel refuses and says to the people of Israel, each of you return home. And that's more or less where our part of the story ends. But the story then goes on in chapter 9 to introduce us to Saul who is brought right to Samuel's door and is ultimately in chapter 10 proclaimed king. So ultimately, Israel gets its first king. However, he can hardly be described as a great success as king and the warnings of God and of Samuel are shown to be all too truly prophetic. While his successor David is certainly successful as a king, he is something of a personal disaster, both as a father and as a husband. And then Solomon, Israel's third king, comes close to fulfilling all the warnings of Samuel. This then is a complicated story, a story that illustrates the complexities and ambiguities of power and the felt realities of a needy culture. A terrified people are there. A reluctant prophet is there, and God, as always, is there. How these three interact at the crucial moments of decision is the very stuff of the story. It illustrates the difficulty of coming to decisions that gain the approbation of God and of the people. This 3,000-year-old tale 
It reminds us that decision making is never easy. That there are always hard choices to be made. And that the will of God in all of that is never simple to discern. And yet, that is what we have to try to do. To try to determine the will of God. However hard that might be. How deep are the wealth and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How inscrutable his judgments. How unsearchable his ways. From God and through God and for God all things exist. To him be glory forever. Amen. We continue our worship singing hymn 705. It is God who holds the nations in the hollow of his hand. Let us now continue our praise in the giving of our offering. Let us pray. Take, Lord, bless and use the offering we bring, not just our money, but our time, our talents and ourselves, for Christ's sake, in the kingdom's cause. Amen.
notices for this Sunday. You'll find them various points in your order of service sheet. If I could particularly draw your attention to the meeting of the Kirk Session tomorrow evening at 7.30, uh, the Bible study group meeting on Wednesday evening at 7.30 in the Mans, to which all are welcome. Uh, details for the church picnic and barbecue next Sunday. Let's hope it's a nice sunny day. Uh, the details are all on the, the For Your Diary page. Um, and those of you who have assiduously read your, your order and on the, the church news page at the foot of it, the note, uh, you will know that next Sunday is not the 24th of May. Um, it's always intriguing how somehow uh, there, there's a, a deliberate error always gets into anybody's orders of service. I, I was famous for them back home in Scotland. Um, but next Sunday there is a, a baptism. There are not three baptisms, but there is one baptism next Sunday. The other things that... Uh, oh, one other thing I did want to mention. Uh, Loads of Love is still looking for donations of jeans, golf shirts and underwear, I assume, Pat. Yes. Um, and if you are able to assist with these, please uh, contact Pat either by speaking to her this morning or telephoning her. Her number is on the page. Jeff, could I ask you to come forward to say something both about the, the MAD production on the 27th and also about the works, the ongoing works? Good morning. As you can see, the shutters and sills have been put in. They look quite nice. The windows are falling apart inside of it, so that's our next part of the program. We're going to start in that one corner there and take the sashes out. We have a container down in the yard. I will build a table by Thursday. The sashes will be sitting there waiting for people to come and do some of their best work. It's, uh, they've got to be scraped down both sides, they're cedar, so the cedar will be finished for the inside and white will be on the outside. Then we need to do the frames around the inside and the outside, so there is a bit of labor intensive. So you may see a bit of plywood around here for the next six months, so, and if it's more labor intensive than that, you might have it around for a whole year. Um, I would like to thank a donor this morning who gave me a substantive check for the restoration fund, which will go to good use. Thank you very much. As regard to MAD production on the 27th, I want to advise that there are 12 people involved in this. We have a, a six-person chorus now. We have uh, Katie Yules joining the group. We have a 10-year-old little girl from Mount St. Agnes who rings his church bells for you with her voice. Um, and we've got a bunch of our own little girls that are available from the Kemp family and, and others. I'm still short three young girls or boys that would like to sing between the ages of 7 and 15. I have Do Re Mi from The Sound of Music that I'm trying to fill out. And I'm also short of a male lead, um, just so that we can share the, some of the 27 songs that we got. It's going to be an amazing evening. Um, the ministries are supplying the food, and that will be, follow in theme the various islands of the world that we're singing songs from. So it starts at 6 o'clock on the 27th. Please reserve your tickets. I believe it will probably be sold out within the next 10 days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. And can I commend to you, uh, if you do have some time to give uh, to the restoration of the windows, it is, as Jeff says, a labor-intensive job. Uh, so if you do have uh, the time uh, to devote to a part of that, that would be extremely helpful in the work. Let us now come to God in prayer with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Loving God, you call each of us to ministry, no matter our age or our experience, for you give to each congregation 
a variety and a richness which we often take for granted. Accept our thanks for each and every person here today. Accept our thanks for the gifts they bring to the whole body of the church, creating enrichment and help. Accept our thanks for the faithfulness of countless people who have never stopped worshipping, even when they have been hurt by the church or were angry with life. Accept our thanks that they put loyalty to you above all else and didn't let their own emotions get in the way of their faithfulness. Accept our thanks too, Lord, for those who have been the church's disturbers, defending the marginalized, stopping us from being inward-looking, searching for the truth ardently but lovingly. Accept our thanks for children and grown-ups who have not held back when asked to serve, those willing people who have been loyal to a task which they only took on for a short time, but which became a long-term commitment of time and energy. Accept our thanks for all who have offered gifts of leadership, not just ordained ministers of word and sacrament, but also elders, board members, musicians, choir members, teachers and ministry team members. But Lord, our greatest thanks is for all faithful Christians who have been clothed in joy, wrapped in humility, shining examples of the way Jesus spoke, healed, taught, and served. For these are the saints of today. Lord, help your church to be an instrument of peace and healing in the world, the world where there is so much hatred and violence, turmoil and uncertainty. And yet, Lord, it remains your world the world for which Jesus came and died, the world in which he now calls us to serve. May you grant us power and vision to respond to that call and to help make the world a better place where all may know your love and compassion. And this weekend, Lord, we pray for world leaders who meet at the G7 conference in Germany. May they particularly seek to make the world a better place, a place of freedom and justice for all peoples. All these things, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Let us sing hymn 512.
May the mystery of God beckon us. May the wisdom of God direct us. May the forgiveness of God heal us. And may the energy of God send us out into the world to exercise justice and love and be a blessing to the nations. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and abide with you this day and forevermore. gather in the front pews of the North Isle if you wish to stay for communion.